on an all-new Dr. Phil. I was pretending to be pregnant, and I was telling adoption parents that I had a baby. She sent me a video of babies moving in her stomach. The adoption scandal imposter. She had hurt so many families. Makes her way onto the stage. This is important to me, and I want a child. I can't have children. And to know that somebody's scamming me, I never meant to go that far. You led them to believe that you had a baby. When you couldn't produce the baby, you got really hostile. I'm done. Will Gabby return to face her victims? Today's going to be a changing day in your life. You've never had anybody working harder to bring you to the threshold of change than right now. Thank you, thank you. Yesterday, we began to unravel an adoption scandal that has devastated hundreds of couples nationwide and made international headlines. An adoption imposter known as Gabby finds unsuspecting childless couples online, wins their trust, then tricks them into thinking she has a baby for them, only to become verbally abusive days or weeks down the line. Finally, when it's time to deliver the child, she just vanishes, leaving the couples heartbroken. My guests yesterday come from all different walks of life, but they have one thing in common. They want this adoption imposter to stop. But who is this individual and how is she managing to cause such devastation? Now, before we get into that, let's take a look at what happened yesterday. I would describe Gabby as methodical, manipulative, and just cruel. Gabby takes other people's identity from the internet, pregnancy photos, and ultrasound pictures. She poses as those are her own. I've confronted Gabby on the phone 10 times. She laughed at me and said, I bet you just at the idea of catching me. Gabby is ruining my business. I hate her for what she's done. She gets sympathy by telling sob stories of being a teen with a boyfriend whose father is making them place the child for adoption. It's like she's a victim. Gabby has targeted an estimated 300 couples across America. Now, one of those couples is here right now. I can't get pregnant because I have polycystic ovary syndrome. Gabby told us that she was 15, she was pregnant with twin girls. Dealing with her was an emotional roller coaster. This isn't a game for us. This is our life. I think that what she's doing is disgusting. When you spoke to her on the phone, did she sound like she was 15? She sounded exactly like any other 15-year-old. You say things got weird when you talked about lawyers. She's like, if you come to my door, I'll punch you in the face. Hello. Nice to meet you. Hi, Gabby. Please don't talk to me. Can we at least say hello? No. We've I'm leaving. No. Go away. Uh, ew. I cannot remember the last time I had a guest this volatile. I'm 24 weeks pregnant. Gabby stole my pregnancy bump update photos. I couldn't comprehend why anybody would do that. I'm extremely terrified that Gabby will find out where I live and try to take my baby once she's born. She got a hold of your ultrasounds, right? And she used these to trick at least four different couples. How does it feel to hear this? I just don't want any more victims. There is absolutely no way to justify what this individual's doing. It is despicable. This is an individual that is not well. This is not somebody that is just doing this out of meanness. This is somebody that is more sick than mean. When you actually spend a few minutes with her, I think you're gonna see what I'm saying. Before we finally meet Gabby, let's hear what she had to say to my producer, Mary Ann. Why do you think you're here? Because I was pretending to be pregnant and I was telling adoption parents that I had a baby that I didn't have. Do you remember the first time you did it? I started at 16. I just hashtag hopeful adoptive parents. You can actually tell like on a profile who's doing adoption. I was using pictures of like friends. I would write a message saying that I was an actual person. I lost my mom at 16 and I moved to a new town, so 
I lost all my friends. It just gave me someone to talk to. How long would you say that you would talk to these couples? Probably four days, and then I would just cut it off. The couple I just got caught with now only lasted five days. How many people would you say you've probably done this? Probably 10. Do you recall the last time you did it? A couple months ago. They actually found out my last name and they messaged my dad. Basically, I found out I couldn't have children at 16 and it really messed me up. I'm jealous because they're pregnant and I can't get pregnant. Have you ever heard of the name of a woman by the name of Kendra? Yes, it was just a big mistake. I just want to say I'm sorry for everyone that I've hurt, but I'm done. It took my team several hours this morning to convince Gabby to leave her dressing room and appear on stage. You have it all over your face. You look ridiculous. <laughs> Can I see your pen? No. Yes! I can go on TV like this. Can I see the pen? No. Hiya, hiya. My name's Tina. Oh, she look at the pen on her face. When that happens. Please don't touch me. I'll, I'll do it. No. Honey, let me do it. Come on, sweetie. You Gabby. Get it off my hand. This is what you look like. Yeah, you can get it off. Thank you. Psych. Oh, come on, girl. I honestly think at this point they're actually waiting on you to get this thing off your okay, face. Okay, do it. I think they're ready. I'm not doing Listen, it. Yes, you are. Listen, I'm gonna be there with you the whole time. I don't wanna go. Why the there f is there a camera? Oh my God. I'm hearing that she is finally ready. Bring her out, please. I'm not. Doing no, it. babe. I don't want any. I know you don't. But yes, you do. <laughs> You're gonna be fine. I'm here with you. I'm here with you. You're gonna be absolutely fine, man. You're gonna be absolutely fine. I'm here. I'm here. Hi, Gabby. There we go. Have a seat right here. Marianne, thank you. You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> well, Gabby, I'm, I'm glad you're here, and I know this isn't, um, it isn't easy or pleasant, and, um, if you would, look at me, and let's just you and I talk for a minute, okay? Um, and I, I want you to understand that, um, we, we both know why you're here, and you need to know that I treat all of my guests with dignity and respect. Nobody's gonna be uh, mean or unkind to you here, but I think that this is something that you wanna put behind you, right? Yeah. You want this to be over with and... I wanna close this chapter. Yeah. And what would it mean to you to close this chapter? Um, apologize. I'm really sorry and understand what I did wrong. Um, I want these charges to be dropped. Mm -hmm. And do you understand, and I'm gonna let, you, let these folks talk to you in a second, but do you understand the effect, the impact of, of what you've done to people that have been hopeful about adopting a baby and you've misled them into thinking that their dream was finally gonna come true? Yes, sir. Tell me what effect you think that has on people um, when they find out that it was all a lie. It crushes them and it hurts them. It makes me look like a bad person too, which I'm not, so. But, but how does it make them feel? We'll talk about you in a minute. How does it make them feel for a mother that cannot have a child, a father that can't s start a family to think, you know, finally they're gonna be able to to hold a child and feel its warmth and and feel its heart beating against theirs and, and be able to raise that child and take pride in that child and then find out that it was all a lie. What, what do you think that does to them? Heartbroken and they feel manipulated. Uh -huh. Have you been heartbroken before? Yeah. 
When, when were you heartbroken? Um, I lost my mom at 16. So. Uh -huh. And how did that feel? Um, uh, it just felt like I was lost. She was my best friend. Mm -hmm. And you said one of the reasons you did this was jealousy. Yeah. But I don't understand if it's jealousy, why would you victimize another woman like yourself who can't have children? I was just looking at the time. I was just looking for someone to talk to. I never meant to go that far. You led them to believe that you had a baby? This is important to me. I want a child to know that somebody's scamming me because I have the same issue you have. And later, towards the end, they started to question you. You got really hostile. Why do you think you felt that way? I don't know. But I'm done. Monday. Jim runs the household like a dictatorship. I expect discipline and respect. A father who thinks he knows best. He says, I only strike them to get their attention, then that's okay. It's ridiculous. You said you manage people in your family by intimidation. I never started that way. Why are you so insecure? I take my ownership. There's a whole whack of ownership there. You're pathetic. A terrible father and a worse husband. That's Monday. Then on Wednesday, he lost 400 pounds, but gained it all back and more. If everybody around you is buying your it ain't gonna change. New Dr. Phil, Wednesday. This is, this is Lauren, and this is Julio. You, you led them to believe that you, you had a baby. You heard her describe what it did to you, too, when it turned out that this was a lie. Does she get it? Um, I think she gets it, but I don't think... I'm in the same boat you are. I can't have children. And to know that somebody's scamming me and I can't have children it has the same issues that I have, I mean, this is important to me, and the adoption is important to me, and... I want a child, so you basically hurt me because I have the same issue you have, and that just isn't good. So in, in a sense, there should be a kinship between you two because you're both in the same situation and you can't have children. Yeah. So it seems odd that you would victimize her when she's in the same situation you're in. When you think about it from that point of view, it, that seems strange, doesn't it? Yeah. Did you just not think about it that way? Not at the time, no. Uh -huh. Towards the end, when it started to be found out, when you couldn't produce the baby, and they started to question you, you got really hostile at times and would yell and scream or call names or say ugly things to them. Why do you think you felt that way? I don't know, but I'm done. Let him talk to you a little bit. Do you open these doors? Do you think it's helping? Do you think it's helping? The lady with her, by the way, is one of our producers, Mary Ann, who she's felt very comfortable with and she asked if she could come out here with her and I said of course if it makes you feel better whatever would make her feel comfortable let me she may come back she may not but what's y'all's reaction to her seeing her and hearing the little bit that you did from her she needs help yeah, it's, it's obvious and it's if nothing else that is want her to be able to work through this. Whatever she's going through, just at, never hurts to ask for help. And there are people out there willing to help you. I think that's what's making me upset is there's so many resources that she can tap into and she, nothing. And she's just taking it out on couples like us. Like, there are too many people. Yeah. Too many people have been hurt by this. Mm -hmm. What's your reaction to her? Um, so I have a huge heart for mental health and special needs. And it breaks my heart that she's in this 
invisible prison. And if she would have told me, I would have talked and talked and talked because I used to do that. That used to be my unit. I used to work a mental health unit and I volunteer for special needs. So I would have been the perfect person to get her out of her shell. And mm -hmm. I knew none of this. Every time I figured out a little bit about her, she attacked me. So it's, it, I feel, I have felt bad for her and it sucked to get manipulated, but we're stronger because of it. But I have, I don't want her to feel like she's in prison in her own mind. That's just sad. Do, do you see why I explained it the way I did? Mm -hmm. Because it, I, I think to, to vent anger at her, although at one level she certainly has earned that and deserves that, Clinically, that's just not something I can support. It's, it's just unsound, and so that's why I had to kind of set the stage. I mean, do you all get what I'm saying here? It, this is um, as despicable as her behavior is. You have to look at where it comes from. Uh, now, Gabby's father is here. Um, he says he's at his wit's end trying to stop his daughter from em emotionally abusing couples that are desperate to adopt. Um, we're gonna talk with him after the break. I desperately need help for my daughter, Gabby. She gets possessed by TV shows, which show moms bearing children. Gabrielle is going nowhere but into deeper, deeper trouble. And later... I can remember the first talk that I had on the phone. I wanted to gut her. I couldn't stand her. She had hurt so many families, and it just was horrible. We found Gabby's dad, Gene, online, so we reached out to him. Gene was so emotionally nervous. I believe Gene is absolutely terrified of his daughter. He didn't understand why she was doing it, it was apparent that he was clueless on the extent of the damage that she has caused. I can 100% feel the love that Gene has for his daughter, but he's not making Gabby responsible for her actions. He has no clue how to help her. He just thinks taking her to the local doctor is the answer. Amy, what was your all's response to... Um hearing from from Gabby from Gabby uh huh well for me it was a little bit of me is broken inside because she is as I'm so sorry she is this amazing girl stuck in this shell and she can't get out I can remember the first talk that I had with Jean on the phone and I I'm gonna just be honest. I have no filter, I'll just tell you straight up. I wanted to gut her. I couldn't stand her. She had hurt so many families that I had picked up so many pieces over and it just was horrible. Families that I didn't even know, you know, that had been taken by her manipulation, she is just destroyed. And that will never, you know, continue on adopting. And, you know, talking with Jean and just hearing the love that he had for his daughter and how he too is a victim and knowing that he didn't know how to help her and how she was before he painted the most beautiful picture of her and he misses that and he wants that he doesn't know how to help her and for me in the very beginning i was on such a different journey with this whole gabby thing to I have a son with special needs. I know how hard it is. And to see what he's doing for his daughter by standing behind her, I would have done the same thing for my son, but I absolutely would have made him responsible for his actions. And that's something Gene's not doing. And um, I just think that he needs to know, like, um, there's help. He doesn't know how to get it. He's clueless on how to get it. 
Well, we're going to turn to that now. Gabby says her family uh, have turned their backs on her, but one man is sticking by her regardless, and that man is her father. And this is what he has to say. My daughter Gabrielle is going nowhere but into deeper and deeper trouble. Gabby's mother passed away in 2012. That was the beginning of severe mental problems for Gabby. After her mother died, she started having behavior problems at school. She threw a rock at a teacher's car. Gabby was bullied because she was different. Gabby finding out that she couldn't have her own child, I believe that's a strong motivation for her deceiving these parents. She gets possessed by TV shows which show moms bearing children. She just thinks that it's not fair that she can't experience that part of life. Kylie contacted me. She told me that Gabrielle had infiltrated her clientele. I have heard stories about how Gabby affected some couples and devastated them. I regret that most sincerely. I desperately need help for my daughter. I don't excuse Gabby's behavior in any way, but I believe if she found the right help, she could get on the right path. Well, Gene, thank you for being here. Um, you've welcome. been listening welcome. to my conversation with your daughter. Yes, sir. She basically says that she does want this chapter to end and that she knows what she's done has hurt people. She's hurt this couple here. She's stolen her identity, stolen Kendra's identity. You know, she says she's done it because she's lonely and uh, jealous and that nobody would talk to her. Well, what's your theory? Why do you think she's doing this? Uh, she's aware of her probable limited mortality. She's aware that she, the doctor says that her having a child would kill her with her heart. What does she think her life expectancy well, is? At one point, the doctors were saying about 30 years. It's certainly less than normal. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, so how did she handle that information? Uh, not very well. I, I don't think she, that, I think she was not equipped to handle that at all. Uh -huh. She's 24 now, so she feels like she may not have that long left in this world? I'm sure she feels that way, yes, uh -huh. sir. What's a day in the life of Gabby? She had been hospitalized about four times at different mental hospitals. And what diagnosis did they give her? Um, she has suffers from um, severe depression, some psychosis. She, um, she hears voices sometimes. Um, she bipolar. It's hard to place her in, like, college or anything because she was always developmentally delayed in special needs. But um, I'm, we're looking for some kind of art class or something. But You don't really know what to do with her? No, sir. That's the question. Um, and I have some others, and I want to hear from these folks. We'll be right back. somebody does what your daughter has done, you always have to say, what's her payoff? Well, I'm back with Lauren and Julio, who have really just had their hearts broken by someone that has really played them about having the opportunity to adopt, which is something that they very much wanted to do. Kendra is here. She's had her identity stolen, uh, pictures of her pregnancy to the point that, you know, when you have your identity stolen and somebody starts pretending to be you, using your pictures, uh, putting them out there, uh, there's a real sense of violation of your person and your privacy, and you wonder, if they stole my pictures, and they stole my identity, where does it stop? 
I mean, are they going to show up at my door someday? I mean, where, you know, where are the boundaries? And I, I, I do want to say to you that uh, I, I certainly don't think you're in danger here in this situation. I don't think she has the wherewithal, the organization, or the motivation to victimize you in the real world like that. I mean, you always take precautions, of course, but I just simply don't think, um, I frankly don't think she's that organized or motivated and efficient enough to, to do that, and that's not the payoff that she's looking for. Her father, Gene, is here. Gabby joined us for a short period of time, and I, I think she did speak from her heart while she was here. I think she was honest. What did you think? I think she was honest. Julio, what did you take away from her? Uh, she was as honest as she could be. Um, and just, I do think there is mental illness to battle through, which yeah. is difficult. I I'll tell you my thinking about this. I think if... I think if you could unscrew the top of her head and look down inside, it would scare the hell out of you. I, I think right now the confusion on her part and, you know, the loneliness and the depression and the isolation and the fear and the sense of being overwhelmed is really a lot uh, at this point. And I, I'm not excusing what she's done in any way. As I said, that is absolutely unacceptable. You know, the question comes down to whether she knows the difference between right and wrong. And she does know the difference between right and wrong. You agree with that, correct? Yes, sir. Um, you know, I always talk about the difference between the irresistible impulse and the impulse not resisted. And those sound a lot alike, but they're distinctly different. And the irresistible impulse is that which comes on you and you just become a passenger. You cannot resist it. And we see that in crimes of passion and insanity defenses, things of that nature. But then there's the impulse that you just choose not to resist. And I think that's what we're dealing with here. She's had this impulse to do this and she's just chosen not to resist it. And maybe she didn't have alternatives. I mean, it wasn't A or B, but she chose not to resist this impulse, knowing that it was wrong. Um, but I think with some help and some alternative choices, I think she would make alternative choices. Because when somebody does what your daughter has done, you always have to say, what's her payoff? Like being hooked on heroin, she goes from one high to the next. And you guys, I'm sorry, just the next in the row. People don't do things in a pattern without a payoff. So you have to say, if you identify the payoff, you understand why they're doing what they're doing. And she's doing this with all these people what's the payoff? And she's told us the payoff is she gets people to talk to her. She feels like the center of attention. She feels like she's the queen for the day. Everything's focused on her. She feels powerful. She feels, you know, all of this currency, it's a big payoff for her. You think, well, but it hits the wall, doesn't that? Well, it doesn't hit the wall if you got 300 of them in a row. You just go from one to the next, to the next, to the next, and it's just this constant currency. She's getting a payoff for playing this role. And you guys are, I'm sorry, just the next in the row. Yeah. And as soon as you find out, she just moves on, ghosts you, moves on to the one behind you. And so she just goes, it's like, it's like being hooked on heroin. She goes from one high to the next. She goes from Julio and Lauren to Susie and Bob. And from Susie and Bob to Carol and Ted. And from Carol and Ted, she goes on to the next. And so it's just, she just stays on a high of being a center of attention, you know, courted, you know, all of these things that make her feel powerful and desirable. And, you know, that's a, that's catnip. I mean, it's a, it's a payoff for her. And until she finds a way to get that, 
that is less destructive, the same validation, the same payoff that's less destructive, she's going to default to this because it's what she knows how to do. And I, th I think she needs serious help. I mean, when you say that she's got all of these diagnoses, uh, major depression and bipolar, um, you know, those are inconsistent diagnoses, by the way. Uh, then she's hearing voices, uh, which is auditory hallucination, which could be uh, psychotic. It could be secondary to medication that she may be inconsistently taking. You just really don't know what all's going on with her, and somebody needs to find out. Somebody needs to find out what's going on with her and get her some coping skills that um, she can use instead of doing what she's doing now. And I'm prepared to make that help available to her if she's willing to avail herself of it. There's an organization that we work with that deals with people that have been through trauma. And I think that she has never really gotten over uh, the trauma that she's been through with regard to her heart and losing her mother and none of these things have ever been dealt with and there's an organization called Onsite and they deal with trauma victims and it's a residential program and it's on the outskirts of Nashville, Tennessee. It's on a hundred rolling acres and they bring in top experts from around the world who work with folks that have really been damaged by trauma and help them learn the coping skills necessary to deal with that in a constructive fashion. And we've talked with them and they are willing to accept her and take her in there and, and work with her on an ongoing basis for however long is necessary to get her feet on the ground and get her seeing the world through some clear lens. And uh, we'll give you the opportunity to learn more about Onsite, but Miles Adcox is the head of that. And uh, I've worked with them for many, many years with great results. And uh, it's not a mental hospital, by the way. They deal with maladaptive behaviors and really help people to behave their way to a healthier place in their life. And I think it would be an ideal place to start with her. And we're going to talk to her about that. And I want your support in her going there. Yes, sir. Still to come, she stormed off but remains backstage. So what's next for Gabby? You guys have been... Um, more understanding than should be expected. Well, like Lauren said, we, we work with special needs kids. We mm -hmm. uh, volunteer with the Special Olympics. She was in a mobile crisis unit for uh, our department. It's mm -hmm. like we understand and like we, we get it. Well, let me, let me say this if I can. You guys know we ask you couple hundred thousand questions it seemed like right? right yes we did a real deep dive with both of you we ask you about because with all guests here we do a cross-sectional history a longitudinal history a medical history occupational history we do everything before you make it here and um, so I know an uncommon amount of information about people that wind up sitting here uh, <laughs> on this stage so I know an awful lot about you two. And I, I'm saying that to say this. There are millions of people watching this show right now. Young women that are pregnant and have made a decision, often a very courageous decision, to place a child for adoption. And I, I, I want to say to those of you that are out there watching, uh, I'm putting the Dr. Phil's seal of approval um, on, on, on this, this very fine couple right here. And 
If, if you do have a child that you are going to place for adoption, which I think is a very selfless thing to do, and God bless you if you've made the decision that that's in the best interest of your unborn child, um, then I, I'm gonna tell you, you would do well if you considered this couple right here. Uh, I have two grandchildren, uh, Avery and London, and uh, I, I would leave them, uh, that's Avery and London, I, I would leave them with these two and never heart skip a beat. Uh, these are good people. And all you have to do is reach us and we'll put you in touch with them. I'd like to thank all of my guests today, and a special thanks to Miles Adcox and Onsite for offering to really work intensively with Gabby. For more information about today's show, log on to drphil.com. Before we go, you may remember that I recently interviewed a founding member of the Innocence Project, Jason Flom and Amanda Knox, who was wrongly convicted of a heinous crime. They've been using their platform to campaign for the release of Jans Soaring. This man spent 33 years in prison for a double murder he says he did not commit. Well, thanks to the tireless efforts of the Innocence Project, Jans was released on November 25th. I shared the good news on my Instagram recently, so congratulations to Jans. We'll be talking with him very soon. We'll see you next time. I 100% support her going to that facility. I trust Dr. Phil. Gabby has been through a lot today, and I just really hope that she takes the help that Dr. Phil offers her. Hi, Gabby. I'm Anthony Haskins, the resource director here at Dr. Phil. How are you? You Hi. look very cozy. Well, Dr. Phil wanted to offer you opportunity to go to a program called OnSite in Tennessee. It's not a psychiatric unit or hospital. It's a program that helps people overcome traumas that have occurred in their history. We want to offer that to you if, I want to go. if that's interested. Excellent. Give me a high five. Really? You're going to go? Yes, I'm going to go. Fantastic. There's been a lot of ups and downs today with Gabby, but in the end, she chose the right thing. She chose herself, and I couldn't be